Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to the new season of the Theory from the Margins lecture series. My name is Patrick Brock from the Department of Culture Studies and Oriental Languages at the University of Oslo, and I will be moderating today's session. We're delighted to announce an exciting series of le lectures for the upcoming year. Our next event will be a lecture by Fadi Bardavil on November 16. So please keep an eye on our website and Facebook page for further details. Before we move on to introducing today's speaker, I would like to say a few introductory words about who we are and what we do. The Theory from the Margins Collective deep reads on current scholarship on post-colonial theory, the decolonial turn, and theory building from the global south. The collective reads works from marginalized communities in the global north and south as well as critical interventions based on in-depth studies of marginalized groups. Theory from the Margins is primarily interested in a contemporary global academic's engagement with what we understand to be theory, and it aims to spark broader discussions about theoretical concepts outside of academia. I am joined today by my colleague Merve Tabor from the Department of Culture Studies and Oriental Languages at the University of Oslo. Without further ado, I now leave the floor to Merve to introduce today's speaker. Thank you, Patrick, for that introduction. Our speaker today is the remarkably incisive and prolific scholar of plant biology and feminist science studies, Banu Subramaniam, who is professor of women, gender, and sexuality studies at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Trained as a plant evolutionary biologist, Banu Subramaniam engages the feminist studies of science in the practices of experimental biology. She is the author of two monographs, Holy Science, The Biopolitics of Hindu Nationalism, and Ghost Stories for Darwin, The Science of Variation and the Politics of Diversity. Subramaniam's current work, which she will be presenting today, focuses on decolonizing botany and the relationship of science and religious nationalism in India. The title of her talk today is Cartographies for Adisciplinary Sciences. And with that, I pass the mic to you, Banu. Thank you for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you, Marve, for this introduction and Patrick for hosting and moderating the session. I'm just so delighted to be here. I think the plan was that I'll speak for about 20 minutes, so we'll have plenty of time for questions. So that's the plan. I'm going to share my screen. A delicate violet lies pressed in a book of sonnets. A translucent rose graces a love note. A wisteria branch with its cascading inflorescence lays on a herbarium sheet. In the biological sciences, animals are pickled, plants are pressed. Pressed plant specimens emerged as a critical method of botanical identification and classification. I speak here because in my current work on botany and its dense entanglements with colonialism and classification, the site of the herbarium exemplifies the botanical imagination. Herbaria emerged because systematic and universal codes were deemed necessary for the easy identification of flora across the globe, critical for the extractive logics of empire. As the botanical sciences developed, herbaria and herbarium samples grew across the globe cementing them as central repositories of a global botanical imaginary and an emerging global universal science, a site that seals its place in the history of plant demography and classification. While the botanical sciences have undoubtedly transformed over the centuries, these early beginnings have left a lasting legacy. In these troubled planetary times, ravaged by the global pandemic and the growing specter of right-wing and authoritarian governments across the globe, the legacies of empire loom large. The need for multi-species and interdisciplinary analyses is abundantly clear. The very handling of the pandemic is saturated with the histories of empire. Legacies of colonialism and slavery have shaped the pandemic at every turn. 
The unchecked development increases the incidence of zoonotic encounters. Globalization hubs quench our insatiable consumerist appetites for cheap products. Chiasmic inequality renders some bodies vulnerable. Persistent disinvestment in public health decimates infrastructures. The pharmaceuticalization of medicine yields profit-centered research and care. The holding of vaccine reinforces global inequalities. The rise in authoritarian governments erodes trust in public institutions. And the rise of misinformation and disinformation campaigns has seeded havoc. Together, these have provided the perfect storm for a raging pandemic. At the heart of the problem is our inability to see the virus as anything but an other, an enemy, cementing our violent vocabularies of battles and wars. These binary models of friend, foe, native, foreign, insider, outsider, mark pandemic politics, as they do in so much of our biopolitical imagination, such as our immune systems. In recent scholarship on theorizing multi-species and more than human worlds, one fundamental critique leveled at the intellectual foundation of Western academia is that the human is central to its imagination. In fact, not just any human, but the human at the center of empire, one that embodies Western male, white, elite, heterosexual, and able-bodied characteristics. Many decades of feminist, queer, indigenous, post-colonial, decolonial, anti-racist, and anti-colonial work have thoroughly repudiated these intellectual foundations. Feminists of color in particularly have challenged the normative foundations of our conceptual and theoretical underpinnings and have also offered seeds for new epistemologies, methodologies, and methods. For example, Chela Sandoval's influential book, Methodology of the Oppressed that inspires my title, offers an overarching metaphor of what feminist theory can offer botany. The herbarium, a global mortuary of colonial botany, is an apt metaphor for the epistemologies of empire, an impoverished site to tell the story of life on earth. Sandoval's work allows us to develop a political methodological landscape for questions of difference. Her framework of differential consciousness offers a robust method for feminist disciplinarity, where differential consciousness operates like a clutch of an automobile, the mechanisms that permits the drive to select, engage, and disengage gears in a system for the transmission of power. Any process of decolonization must engage and re-engage the, the clutch multiple times. As knowledges from many disciplines and interdisciplines uproot and reroute botanical wisdom, by mobilizing love as a category of critical analysis, Sandoval opens up new possibilities of alliances, consciousness, and politics. Two particular insights inspire me. First, that we reject binaries between imperial and subaltern knowledges because the master's tools were often fashioned by subalterns whose social location and political desires left imprints on the tools themselves. We need rich accounts that trace the dense imbrications of indigenous knowledges within the canon of Western and imperial science. Second, a profound legacy of Western imperialism. Um, here, here's a quote by Leanne Simpson and part of what she argues, there are th three things that colonialism did in the ways in which it worked. First, it used gender violence to remove indigenous people from their and descendants from land. They removed agency for plants and animals. And then they repositioned the lands as natural resources that could be used um, you know, for colonial nations. So a profound legacy of Western imperialism was to remove agency for plant and animal worlds and to transform them into natural resources. So how do we then develop methodologies of the pressed that accounts for the violence and appropriative ambitions of empire? For Sandoval, the answer is love. Not the love of romance novels, but love reinvented as a political apparatus, retooled as a potential technology that brings together diverse knowledge practices that rebuild the world. This is the project before us. In drawing on Sandoval and extending her differential consciousness of third world women into the realm of the vegetable, vegetal world, I'm not suggesting some naive alliance or symmetry between oppressed worlds of human and vegetal. Rather, I mean to extend the analytic power of Sandoval's love to understand plant worlds as agentic worlds, not like human, but in their own right 
We do not have to become plants or they us. We do not need to make them in our image or us in them. Sandoval's work allows us to develop a political methodological landscape to help deal with questions of difference across a plentiful world on earth. The problem is not difference. As Audre Lorde has long reminded us, I quote, it is not those differences between us that are separating us. It is rather our refusal to recognize those differences and to examine the distortions that result from our misnaming them and their effects upon human behavior and expectations, end quote. If we extend Sandoval, Lord, and Simpson's challenge to recognize colonialism as an ecological project, we learn to recognize how imperial ambitions set out to objectify and commodify not only some people, but also animal and plant worlds. With this, we enter a rich territory of analysis. Indeed, rather than being reduced to their ancestors and pressed herbaria sheets as botany would have us believe, Plants emerge as agentic, agile, and transforming organisms. They mutate, adapt, and evolve at every turn. Indeed, as Sumana Roy argues, the vegetal world lives in tree time and should not have to live in industrial time of humans. Despite our best technological efforts, we cannot rush the vegetal world to bend to our desires. Imperial sciences like botany and zoology and their rapacious desires had to confront this during colonial rules. In order to keep imperial botany alive, vegetal agency and vegetal time necessitated the invention of savior science, like conservation biology, restoration ecology, and invasion biology. The vegetal world always dandelions or dandelions like eucalyptus or eucalyptus like oaks. Each has uniquely evolved biologies and their varied histories, biological and social, and evolutions have firmly embedded in their spirited lives. The point here is to give plants agency, not in some human-centric way that makes them talk, walk, feel, hear, and think like humans, or in some abstract way that places their disembodied existence in the political economy of human social worlds. Rather, it is to take seriously that plants are not inert or insentient beings. In responding to their environments, they transform their surroundings as much as they are transformed. Evolution and ecological transformations are always co-constituted, co-evolutionary, co-productions. If we take these insights seriously, we cannot co collapse all vegetal life into one category, any more than we should the human, non-human, or diverse human worlds. All organisms need to be accorded the respect of their specificity of their unique evolutionary and ecological lives if we are serious about understanding life on Earth. We need to recognize the breathtaking diversity of life on Earth while resisting the deep impulses within SDS scholarship to purport to engage the sciences and the scientific through fa for facile modes of engaging biological metaphors. For example, I'm troubled by the effortless ways in which the rhizome and the rhizomatic has taken root. No doubt there are plant rhizomes, but the ways in which biological characteristics get appropriated from the biological to the cultural to suggest some kind of essential characteristic of all knowledge shared across science and the humanities is problematic. The vegetal world is breathtakingly diverse. For every rhizome, there are non-rhizomes. For every mutualist, a parasite. For every cross-pollinator, a resolute in inbreeder. We need to move beyond binary logics to multinary ones. Multinary worlds from the biological sciences should inspire, inspire us to move beyond clonal rhizomatic imagination to worlds of promiscuous possibilities of the horizontal transfer and lateral inheritance that the worlds of bacteria and viruses unleash. Bacteria and viruses that move genetic material across species challenge binary logics, including species logics. Drawing on the burgeoning literatures in queer ecologies, we need to queer knowledge. Here I use the verb queer primarily as method. Queering here embodies an openness to the unexpected, the uncertain and the unknowable as its defining feature. To queer is to make strange. It is an undoing or de-
these possibilities, willful cross-pollination and joyful miscegenation. The exuberance of life on earth reminds us that nature abhors categories. The rule is that there are always exceptions. While I earlier cautioned against the impulse to essentialize biological knowledge into theories in the humanities, we must recognize the deep resonance of theories of knowledge across the humanities and the sciences. For example, Karen Cardozo and I have argued that the idea of genera in biology is intimately, intimately linked to the idea of genre in literature. Disciplines are deeply entangled, but we need to be careful about where the coevolution and synergies lie. There is much fertile territory and coevolution across these fields that is worth and indeed critical to engage with. We need to displace the dead metaphor and the herbarium into what Mariana Silgiska and Olga Siemeska coined the plantarium. Uh, I quote, multi-dimensional perspective on uneasy plant-human relations rooted in concrete stories that reveal local botanical knowledges while reflecting the planetary consciousness. In the plantarium, we tell the stories of plants not in their anatomical precision at death, but with their living histories, ecologies, and evolutions that produce them. In the plantarium, we highlight the histories, political economies, and the extractive logics of the plantations that undergird the disciplinary logics of the plants and the entangled world we have inherited. Plantariums reveal the extractive logics, de dehumanizing practices, and purity politics of empire. The needs of empire were perfected by individual academic disciplines, each crafting methods and methodologies for perfecting colonial expansion exploitation. It is precisely in refusing the purity of disciplines, discarding the purity of methods and methodologies that have been disciplined into us, that we can begin to the project of recovering planetary life. As Mohsin Hamid reminds us, in these pure times, you believe more impurity is desperately needed. Only impurity can save us now. But fortunately, there are reasons for hope. Our species was built on impurity and impurity will probably come to our rescue once again, if we let it, end quotes. Thank you. I'm going to stop sharing and happy to engage in conversation. Thank you very much, Banu, for this very enlightening talk. Um, I open the floor now to questions, and we're, we're going to start with Mervy. Thank you, Banu, for this insightful and thought-provoking uh, talk. I have a lot of questions, but I'll start with one. Um, so your critique of the colonial histories of botany and its associated concepts and practices engages mostly with uh, what we could call Western or European sciences, right? So um, do we see examples of other um, scientific practices, for example, like indigenous sciences um, that kind of push back against the herbarium or um, the limitations that some of the um, colonial uh, conceptions of things like native and alien species or invasive species that are produced by um, like European uh, yeah. the European tradition. Can you give some examples of indigenous sciences? So the this project is really about the science of botany, which is entirely a Western science. And so, for example, in, and I doubt it's any different at your institution, but when you study botany, you are not taught indigenous sciences. Now, there may be a subject called ethnobotany that has emerged. Um, so that may be a place where you study it. But botany is, is really a study of plants without people. People don't appear in it. And I think that's the fundamental critique of uh, the epistemology, which takes people and context out and then just focuses about the you know focuses on the plant and the experiments are reductionist in that I will take a plant and introduce you know nitrogen and phosphorus and different levels and see what the plant does right but it's it, it removes all context from the plant so it's that kind of epistemology that I'm critiquing but you're absolutely right there is there are rich indigenous traditions all across the world that have been underexplored. Um, and if we dig deep, some of those practices do show up in botany as well. 
So if you think of a lot of drugs that um, you know Western medicine has produced, a lot of them come from indigenous medicine of recognizing there's some group that's using the leaf of or the bark of some plant and then they further find the active ingredient and then it becomes a drug. Um, and this, you know, this sense of biopiracy continues on. And so, so there are some ways, part of what colonialism did was take those indigenous knowledges and then appropriate them. Um, you know, within the, so they, they're not removed from each other, but they're certainly not acknowledged um, within the science of botany. And I think they should be. So we need to historicize um, the field, and then we need to open up how we study plants and understand them. Thank you very much, Bano. Um, I have a question on uh, science fiction and imaginaries. Um, I work with imaginaries, especially science fiction imaginaries and social activism. And I want to ask you about the potential role for these imaginaries in building more diverse futures. I understand these spatial imaginaries as an entanglement in nature and culture, like the Andes region and the different peoples and cultures which live in it. Um, I think that's a great question. And I honestly think that is where our future lies, is in imagination. Um, and both in recovering imaginations that we have erased, you know, from our repertoire that we have forgotten, some of which we have lost, but some still remain. And I, I think those should be sources for inspiration. Because I think, uh, to me, a lot of, we were talking earlier about, um, you know, the traditions of magic realism that really don't do what botany does, which is it does not separate plants from um, the world around. There is no separation of material worlds and non-material worlds between humans and animals. Um, so these are very entangled imaginaries. And I think part of, our, uh, part of the problem to me about climate change is really about how, you know, we have vivisected a living planet into these disciplinary silos. You know, the sciences will study nature, social sciences will study society, the humanists will study culture. And then we have said the natural scientists, their object of knowledge is, is nature. And so each object of knowledge is different and you will use these methods and you will use these methods, right? So there's a way in which when we are trained in disciplines, we become, I think, much too specialized. So when something like climate change emerges, no individual discipline has the tools to engage with it because then, you know, what has happened in the world outside is all these things have been mixing with each other. And so I think as, uh, you know, uh, within, the, uh, within the academy, we really need to develop interdisciplinary tools, which means we cannot think of plants without people. We cannot think of plants without the environment around it. And so to me, um, indigenous um, ecologies, indigenous literature are sources for other kinds of imaginations. I think the other point you're making, I think is really important, which is one about place and how important place is. And I think any biologist would say, you know, organisms adapt to space, to the places they live in, right? Or whether it's high altitude or low altitude, whether it's in the ocean or a desert, that matters for what adaptations a plant needs. And so when you, um, so one of the, you know, things I've been thinking a lot about is within indigenous um, ecology, the idea of native is very important. But I would argue the native of indigenous ecology is not the same as native of invasive species. Within invasive species, a native is a litmus test of where did you come from? You know, did you come from somewhere else? versus the native and indigenous um, ecology is about generations of entangled living with the plant and animal worlds around. It is a relationship. It is not about where did you come from? And in fact, in many indigenous societies, um, they welcome migrants. And the question is to figure out why did this happen? How can we live with? It's not this, lit, you know, this, I think, colonial imaginary of you belong here and you belong there but really about entangled living. 
And so I would completely agree with you that um, the literature, oral histories, oral tradition, ecological traditions are ones that might save us, um, you know, from the world that seems to be before us. Thank you very much, Bano, for the insightful response. I have a question from the audience here, from uh, Antoine Guiguet, hopefully I pronounced it right. He's asking how to avoid human or animal centrism when talking about plant agency. Since these organisms are not individuals, but individuals, are you familiar with the work of the plant biologist Stefano Mancuso? I am. Um... So this is a, this is a very this is a very big question mm -hmm. of um, how one talks about plant agency, and um, there's also I mean to me a way there's a whole resurgence of um, what people call um, tree loving plant loving so and part of what I'm seeing in um, um, so, you know, you look at the New York Times, the Washington Post, so much of the popular books are really trying to, in, in claiming agency for plants, are claiming human vocabularies, right? Plants are intelligent, plants can feel, plants can communicate. Um, and I think it's a fair point of, you know, that we don't want to live in a human-centric world, uh, human exceptional world, where only we can think and see and feel. And Yes, other organisms also um, produce it, but uh, that kind of human vocabulary also troubles me. And part of, because I don't know that, so it's clearly plants do things. They don't do things like humans. Um, so of how to develop plants world and plant agencies without collapsing them into the human. And part of what, um, troubles me about some of this literature is the ways in which um, plants become agents, where they become very human-like. And I would like to go around that, even though I um, appreciate, you know, the world of, Mancu you know, um, Mancuso and there, there are numerous others who are working on questions of, you know, plant feeling, plant neurobiology, plant neural networks, plant intelligence. Um, whether plants are, you know, form community, whether they mother, right, the idea of the mother tree. Um, so there's a lot of work afoot um, there. Thank you very much, Bono. Um, we have a question here from uh, John Mitchell, and he's asking, how do you reconcile your critique of botany as a science that sees plants without people in your critique of Western science as human-centered? That's such a beautiful question. Thank you for pointing that out. You're absolutely right. Um, but I, I think the, um, the, the plants without people is still a human-centric plant. I think that is the point I'm trying to make. It is, um, it is using plants for what they can do for humans. So in agriculture, it is about trying to figure out how can we increase productivity of plants? The entire field of plant breeding has been, can we produce, you know, increase yield, can we produce drought resistant plants, you know, flood resistant plants. Um, so, so even though it's a world of plants without people, it's human controlling the plants for the benefit of humans, right? So even a field like conservation biology, when you look at its roots, was about colonists saying, you know, so if we keep cutting trees, if we keep um, using up um, colonial plant worlds, what will we extract in the future? So we need to create a natural world in the colonies that can keep producing things, you know, for the colonizers. So in part, the field of conservation biology, you know, emerged because of those, you know, of that long-term um, thinking. Um, and so even a field like conservation biology, where we would think it puts conserving nature Humans are still at the center of it, but I, I think that was beautifully put on your part and I will be more careful in how I articulate it in the future. I think there was a hand up by someone. Yeah. Yes, yeah, okay. that's right. Um, 
There is a hand up from Chin Tina. I'm so I'm gonna allow her to speak so she can pose the question. Then we'll have a question from Mervy. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Okay. No, I was just wondering that uh, there seems to be uh, a kind of rejection of analysis somewhere. I mean, I think when you're talking about the specificity of, uh, say, the plant way of being versus uh, the human way of being and not collapsing the two, we're not rejecting analysis, you know? I mean, there's we are not rejecting to... analysis. Yes, but there seems to be a problem here, a, a verging on saying, you know, the synthesis is important, you know, rather than categorizing or classifying. I mean, analysis means classifying. So you do separate. I don't know if I'm uh, mixing up uh, your uh, understanding. So, but I think the question is, what, what do we analyze? How do we categorize? Mm -hmm. And why right. are we doing that? And I think that's my point. That the uh -huh. within, if you look at the history of botany, it was all mm -hmm. to create an extractive empire. Mm -hmm. So I'm not against, you're right. I think we need to know which plants are poisonous and which aren't poisonous. Yeah. And Those the are categories, thing. they're important, but they serve a particular function. But yes. when you look at the history of botany, if you look at mm -hmm. why and how they categorize plants, it was mm -hmm. towards a, a particular political end of colonialism. So that's the part I'm crit critiquing. I think so we should do better analyses and synthesis than we do. Right, thank you. Yeah, that's it. Thank you, Gina. Um, Mervish, could you please ask the next question? Mm -hmm, sure. Um, actually, our colleague, Seang Peron, had uh, a question and he's not here. So I will ask his question and combine it with mine because I think that they're related. So he was asking, is the colonial or imperialistic tendency a cyclical phenomenon regarding power, politics, and biology? And I would like to add to that question a question concerning the historicity of the field of botany and um, the historical changes in perception of plants and uh, invasive species. Let's take, for example, three historical moments. Firstly, we have the inception of modern botany as a Western science with its colonial roots. Um, secondly, uh, we have, for example, the post 9-11 context, which you identify in one of your articles as the period in which discourses, particularly on invasion biology, and the war on, on terror have become have increasingly become more like divergent, more entangled. And thirdly, for example, we have the current situation with the pandemic and the climate crisis. So this is not to say that these are like mutually exclusive moments and we could identify other moments in time. But when we look at these like moments in time, how do we see the field of botany change? And how do we say, see its definitions of or like practices of um, like, yeah, like the herbarium or how its conception of invasive species change. And I'm particularly interested in um, hearing about how the growing urgency of climate change and the possibility of human and non-human extinction today is impacting conceptions of things like invasive species and what is native and what is alien. Like, do we see a new, uh, do we see a new form of this course emerging that is perhaps not colonial or, or do we see uh, like a recirculation and retell retelling of, of the colonial story, which I think links back to Peyang's question, like is this cyclical or with the climate change discourse and discourse on extinction, do we see something else emerging that promises for perhaps a decolonial approach? That's great, great, great questions. Now, I don't understand what you mean by this cyclical colonial or imperial, meaning it keeps it keeps happening. There's a certain cycle. Mm -hmm. That was Theang's question, but I guess, yeah, he's meaning that does it keep coming back, I guess? or the, I Well, mean... I think I would argue it never went away. You know, that part of, I, I would say that we can talk about the coloniality of botany. So the infrastructures of botany are, are infrastructures and epistemologies we inherited from colonial time. And part of what I'm trying to figure out is how do we disengage from those logics? Mm 
right? So your question on invasive species is a great one. And so if you look at the long arc of colonial, you know, of the planet, right? So we start off with, you know, one um, a, um, continental body or Pangea, then, you know, that breaks up and then you have continental drift, the continents move to different parts. So plants that were together now move to different parts. They evolve to their, you know, in their new locations, new species are produced, right? And um, so there are a number of um, uh, historians who would argue that if we, that the best way to think about e uh, colonialism is as ecological imperialism, that colonialism was fundamentally an, an ecological project because it was about trying to extract resources from lots of different places. And part of what colonists did, um, Alfred Crosby say, is re-knit the seams of Pangaea. So they took plants from here, moved it there, they moved animals across, they tried to recreate their you know, new Europe's wherever they went. And when they took it, they took plants and animals and germs, you know, along with them in different parts. So once you think of Pangea spreading up, so in a way, what colonialism did was reshuffle, you know, plants and animals across the world into what I would call the biggest biological invasion that, you know, that we've seen. And then you begin to see, you know, various freedom movements. Um, and as countries get independent, colonial nations, um, you know, retreat back. And then we begin to see this um, closing of the borders, right? So in the US, the rules of immigration um, of who can come and who can't. And the immigration and quarantine rules, the quarantine rule comes one year before the immigration rules in the US. So again, how we think about foreign plants and how we think about foreign humans are closely intertwined. So before this, you would have, um, you know, the US Department of Agriculture would send scientists, biologists across the world saying, find a, you know, any, bring back anything interesting, bring back anything useful, anything pretty, anything beautiful. So it was a time of open borders. So th there was no concept of foreign species or invasive species. So it's at a particular time in the early 19th century that uh, historians chronicle the first idea of the native and the foreign um, in Britain when someone was trying to produce the true British flora. So to say what is truly British, you have to say what is not British, right? And so you begin to see this distinction. And, um, and then with rising nationalism, you begin to see how we talk about plants, foreign plants and uh, animals, much like how we talk about foreign humans. Every time historians have chronicled that you see a xenophobic moment in the country, you will see a germ panic or something against a uh, foreign plant or humans. So the ways in which we think that the xenophobia sort of transcends species into some kind of foreign. Um, and so when we look at that, so invasive species is rather, it's a new field only since 1990s really as a subfield in botany. And so when you look at historic, his, historically, we haven't thought about plants in this vocabulary. So it is a rather recent phenomenon. And your question in terms of thinking about the future is really, really important to me because I um, part of um, my argument is that with climate change, we are already seeing Plants are moving, um, you know, uh, they are migrating northward. Uh, some plants are flowering earlier. Um, so there's a lot of change already afoot. Um, soils have transformed, the air has, has transformed. So it is not clear to me what we mean by native anymore and whether the native is adapted to its environment just because of um, what has happened with climate change and what seems to be getting faster and faster in terms of those changes. So I sort of feel it is a clunky old term and an old framework that will not help us deal with questions of what is happening here. We can want all we want for a native plant to grow here, but the amount of effort it will take to create that bubble of the environment it, it was adapted to, um, you know, is, is more, I think, that we can handle. So it seems that the biologists who are thinking ahead are thinking about how do we retool, you know, our biology? What if we just throw out these concepts? What if we think about 
um, what things need to be adapted to, uh, what if we watch what is ha happening. And some of them are going to the past of other kinds of environments that existed and what grew well during those times. So some of it is sort of giving up those questions of ident geographical identity and uh, you know, moving ahead because that is what it seems the political and ecological moment necessitates. And so these colonial, these ideas that have you know, come with us seems, don't seem to fit what we need. Thank you, Bono. Uh, we have another question from an anonymous attendee in the audience. And they are asking, I appreciate the point you make regarding not collapsing vegetal agency into human-centric terms. In some speculative fiction, the other remains ultimately unknowable. So the question is, without collapsing agency into anthropocentric terms, where and how would this figuring of vegetal agency fall in the spectrum of intelligibility? I think that's a great question. And I wonder if the anonymous attendee has ideas I would love to hear. Um, and I, I think some of it is, uh, to me, this is where I think I go to, uh, you know, what Patrick was saying about fiction and, um, you know, imaginative worlds outside, because even so much of science fiction, I find is um, so, not only human, so Western centric, even the aliens always eat with knives and forks, you know, they always sit at a table. <laughs> so it seems like our imagination is so impoverished of what we consider a life, what we consider intelligence. And I think the earlier question about uh, Mancuso, I think this is what some botanists are trying to do is to open up those worlds. And to me, rather than collapse, when I'm saying not wanting to be hu human centric, I think we need more vocabulary. We need more world, more words for what happens in the plant and animal worlds beyond the human terminology of crying and grief and happiness and sorrow. Uh, I think we need other words and maybe humans do some of that. Um, even within, um, uh, you know, when we were talking about indigenous uh, studies, the kinds of vocabularies that exist in languages across the world that don't exist in English when they're describing botanical worlds. Again, I think we don't know enough about this. And I think more needs to be written about the ways in which people who live in a particular area, who have lived with them for generations, have developed terminologies um, you know, of those areas. But still the majority of botany, um, there was a recent study looking at the botanical genome. And they said the vast majority of uh, those studies are what they call parachute science, which means uh, botanists from the West parachutes into a formerly colonized country, takes botanical samples, flies back here, crunches them, and then publishes them, right? So it's still a very, botany by and large is still a very colonial enterprise done within, you know, Western botanical traditions, rather than engaging with peoples who live with these plants in other parts of the world and developing an ecological understanding with them. Um, so I feel, a, but in order to do that, botany needs to be a different science than it is. We need to figure out how to build collaborations and how to build collaborations with respect and, um, you know, that are equal, right? Where people can say, no, I don't want you to study this. And, and some of this is very alien to the field of botany. So I think some of this is where interdisciplinarity becomes important, where we learn how to work across difference, not only non-human, but even between different human groups. Thank you, Bano. Uh, Merve, could you please read the next question in the Q&A? So we have a question by Antoine Guiguet. Uh, most of your critiques about botany appear to target taxonomy. Do you consider that the methodology and the aims of taxonomy should be deeply modified? And if yes, how? Or more radically, is taxonomy too entangled with its colonialist roots and must be abolished? A million dollar question, but it's a great one. And so in part, taxonomy comes up just because I was go talking about the herbarium and the taxonomy is important um, to the history of the herbarium. Um, so within taxonomy, there is a, 
So for example, um, last year, if you remember the roads must fall movement that started in South Africa, which was looking at the legacy of this colonist Cecil Rhodes. And so, you know, the name was taken out of countries, a lot of buildings and statue of Cecil Rhodes were, you know, um, taken down or renamed. But there are still 126 plants named after Rhodes. So much of, um, you know, botany in terms of as colonists went across the world and found new species, they were often named after, you know, emperors and queens or on the colonists, you know, who, who went there. And so, you know, people are asking, should we rename these? Why, why does Rhodes get to stay in this? And so this is, I think, a debate happening within the field. There is always, you know, a lot of people who are always resistant to change in any, any field who feel this would be anarchy. It's like, then they want to come and change this other thing. And then what do we do? Um, so, but I, I, I personally think that this is an important debate the field ought to be having. Now, the other, the other question for me is also about what it is taxonomy did. So when you think of the legacy of Linnaeus, part of the reason why we needed a universal terminology was in part, so we knew we were talking about the same species. From the point of view of co colonialism, if there was a spice here that was really important and there was something here that sounded similar, you wanted to know it was the same thing, right? So part of the impetus for a universal botany is within the, um, um, you know, within the specter of colonialism that it emerged. But part of what that did was local names were erased. So I don't know if this is true for you, but certainly for me growing up, um, you know, I grew up with plants around. I mean, I grew up in urban India, but still there were plants around. And and the, the, disc, the words for the plants I knew around me were very descriptive. So it was the flame of the forest because it, you know, the flowers were orange and it looked like the forest was a flame or the touch me not plant. So a lot of the name, names are around medicinal properties or how they look or how they flower. And then, but once I went to school, suddenly it was all Latin, right? I had to study all these names in Latin. And very often I had to study, you know, plants and fruits and, you know, which I was never going to encounter in my life um, in India, like, you know, poetry of the daffodils. Um, and so a much of post-colonial education in India you know, the elites that after independence, elite Indians who developed the system pretty much followed a British style education. So I would argue so much of post-colonial education is a study in alienation. So I knew the world around me and part of what botanical education did was alienate me from that world because I had to learn, you know, names in botany that did not, that were foreign, right? And I think, suspect it's not just me. This happens across the world. And there have been some people who've been writing about whether our disconnection with the world around us is because of this Latinizing of the world around us. And with the kind of digital technologies that we have, why can't we have multiple names? We have many languages in the world. Botanists can do what they want to do, but why not um, nurture multiple vocabularies um, other kinds of terminologies that's not a uh, Linnaean binomial nomenclature. And so I'm sort of inclined towards thinking about how we can open up um, the field of taxonomy, um, you know, beyond this binomial Linnaean system of nomenclature. Um, thank you, Bono. Uh, I want to ask you about the idealization of ancient knowledge and myth making and the role it plays in nationalism. Because uh, some futurisms that uh, which I study, they try to recover past knowledge which has been erased by colonialism. But at what point does this process become unhealthy? How can we set boundaries? Wow, that's such a great and important question. And for, for me, especially coming from India, because we are seeing this happen in a very unhealthy way, um, you know, um, within the Indian context, where um, ancient knowledge, because part of when people recover ancient knowledge, we are often looking at history through the present, right? So there are often political lenses um, through which we are doing it. I agree with you that we don't want to follow into some kind of proto-nativism 
or you know a way in which we fetishize um you know indigenous um cultures or societies as the so so I, I understand those dangers and many indigenous scholars write that you know cultures are living and we need to understand them as living and not fossilize them to you know to some uh, point in the past um so I, I don't know if there's any easy answer to that except that we think critically about it so much as I think there is there are um, there is a rich history of India, including a rich botanical history. I am very wary of Hindu nationalist claims about, um, you know, an ancient past because it is so geared towards a particular vision of a supremacist Hindu country um, that um, and against uh, religious minorities who live in India versus, you know, India to me has always been um, a multi-religious, diverse country because it uh, in 1947 it brought together lots of different kingdoms and queendoms and societies across into. So India was an imagined country that I think Hindu nationalists are trying to remake. Um, but I think that um, a careful engagement with history, I think, will allow us to think about what resources are available while always being reflexive about the dangers of misrepresenting history, of adding a new political um, lens to it. Uh, and I don't think we can ever avoid that, right? We always see through our present issues. But I think so much of the methodologies and innovations in the humanities and social sciences are about this question. You know, things can never be abstract and objective, but that doesn't mean everything has to be relative. You know, we can uh, make informed choices, we can think through issues. But I think the dangers you're talking about are very, very real. And that sometimes these imagined pasts are so such powerful nationalistic um, material, right, that our leaders use um, to fuel hatred over some and to claim some kind of um, supremacist um, culture. Thank you, Bano. Uh, Merve, could you please pose the next question from the Q&A? So we have a question by uh, the anonymous attendee. Thank you so much for an amazing talk. I'm interested in your reference to the relations between the subaltern and the colonizer, since the subaltern built many of the tools as well as you noted. Could you tell us a bit more about how you understand the subaltern in your research? Can there be even such a thing as subaltern science? Again, I mean, it's such a great group, such good questions. Um, so the, the place I've thought about it most um, in this work I'm doing is in thinking about um, a 16th century Dutch treatise called the Hortus Malabaricus. And so it was commissioned by uh, the Dutch governor in the Malabar region in India. And it was, it's a compendium of the plants that exist around them and especially plants that have medicinal value. And the people he commissioned um, in order to do that, uh, you know, were local healers, local medicine people. Um, and um, not all their names are there, but there are a couple of names there. Um, for example, one is uh, Achutan Nair, Iti Achutan Nair, who is a Dalit, um, um, seen as a Dalit medicine man who, you know, comes from I mean, what one would call indigenous medicine there. I don't want to give names to it because over the different centuries, all these things have transformed in different ways. And so now um, in recent history, for example, um, the um, Arava community, which is who, where uh, Chudan Nair belongs to, you know, have said, we want all the Hortus Malabaricus repatriated to Kerala, you know, to India. Um, and, and so in a way, you could also argue that it is that local, you know, subaltern knowledge that is in the Hortus Malabaricus. Uh, Linnaeus um, draws from this more than any other text um, when he is developing his, um, you, you know, his, his treatise and his naming system. So there are many such examples where um, when you look at these different, uh, you know, uh, 
these different catalogs, when you look at medicinal um, catalogs of various kinds, it is no local knowledges, um, you know, that get um, taken up. And in part, these treatises go to um, go back to Amsterdam. And then it's again a complicated thing of translation, right? It's written in the local Malayalam lingo there. It gets um, translated into Dutch and then into Latin. And then e there are things lost at each step. So it's, it's a fascinating story. But we, we can connect what is happening there to today, the idea of biopiracy, right? Which is the same um, issue that happens. And so the Indian government has, and uh, along with other countries, they've developed their own traditional knowledge database because there were uh, you know, Western groups that were trying to patent turmeric and pat patent rice and the neem tree. And in order to fight that, you needed to show that there is a, you know, that people knew about this plant before, so you can't patent it as new knowledge. And so then the question becomes, who does this hortus belong to? If it belongs to the Arava community, can the Indian government claim this as a traditional knowledge database? So it brings up really troubling questions um, given the politics of power in India, the politics of caste in India. Um, and um, so I, I don't know that there's an easy answer. And similarly, the subaltern in different parts of India have a different relationship with the state and different histories um, there. But I think it's a really important question that I suspect is going to um, rightfully haunt us in the near future. Uh, thank you, Bono. Uh, we have another question from Sheena Jain. She raised her hand, so I'm going to let her talk and ask her question. Go ahead, Sheena. Thank you so much, yes. Uh, I mean, it's such a stimulating uh, discussion. I was just wondering about this Latinization uh, problem that creates alienation, as you said. Wouldn't it be equally true of a Western uh, student? Exactly. Uh, Agreed. Time? So why yeah. do we, uh, you know, uh, relate it to colonialism or any kind of, you know, it's like using X, Y, Z as symbols uh, to do a, do a scientific uh, analysis. Of course, yes, there, it's rooted in taxonomies with a history which may be related to, let us say, a particular powerful ruler whose name is used, etc. But beyond that, it's equal alienating for a Western student um, to find that a daffodil becomes something else in a scientific uh, terminology in Latin. So I'm, I'm just a bit worried about uh, this. No, uh, the reason I problem. call it colonization is because of who did it and why they did it. So those are the colonial roots. But uh, the point I was making after that, uh, that people across the world are arguing that using local names, not using local names, are creating um, why or you know most of the world seems disconnected. The argument is mm -hmm. that this Latinization is part of it. But I talk mm -hmm. about colonial histories because of who did this. So if you look at um, you know Linnaeus and his influence on um, nomenclature, it's immense, right? And the but reason the for doing it is to those. have common names for the um, for for botanists and for the colonists right. to be able to identify. Fine, I, I do see the nuance uh, that I may have missed. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much for all of your questions. We are approaching the end of our session. I'm wondering whether Mervy, would you like to ask another question? I'm good. I asked my questions and some of the questions that were asked we're already on my list, so I don't have anything to add at the moment. Great. Any final considerations from Banu? No, thank you all. These have been great questions, and I will think about them some more. Well, thank you very much for joining our uh, session, Banu, and Mervi as well. And uh, for all of you there who are following this stream, our next lecture will be with Fardi Bardaville on November 16th. So, Keep an eye on our website and Facebook page for further details. So again, thank you very much. And I'm finishing wrapping up the session now. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Bono. Thank you, everyone.